Good morning. Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Easter. It is good to see you all here. We're a little over halfway through the Easter season. It is 50 days long, covering seven Sundays. It's a long one, but there's a lot to talk about because it's Easter, right? We celebrate, we uh, celebrate Jesus, we celebrate hope, we celebrate life. And it's good to have that length of time to specifically focus on it. We also wish a good morning to all of you who are worshiping with us online. We pray that you're well, and we invite you to participate with us in the service. Sing the hymns, offer the congregational responses, and we also invite you to have a cracker or piece of bread and some wine or juice nearby so that you can share communion with us at that point in the service. I invite you all to stand as we worship and give praise to God for the blessings in our lives. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Seeking reconciliation with God and neighbor, let us remember the gift of baptism and confess our sins. To you, O oh God, all hearts are open and all desires are known. We come to you confessing our sins. Forgive us in your mercy and remember us in your love. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, and lead us in justice and truth for the sake of your goodness in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 
By water and the Holy Spirit, God gives you a new birth. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God forgives you all your sins. May the God of mercy and might strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Risen Savior, your followers establish churches in communities near and far. Inspire us to teach your message in word and action that we may witness to your presence wherever we are. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Kids, come on over. Bring snacks, bring a grown up. Whatever's gonna make you comfortable. There we go. Good morning. How are you guys? Sleepy. Kids at heart, good morning. How are you today? Yeah, everybody have a good week? Yeah? Kids, did you have a good week? Yeah, kind of, you went to school. No. We gotta work on your negativity. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah, homework is kind of a hassle. Yeah, you've got got a point there. Okay, so what I've got here is a Bible. Right, you guys know what a Bible is, right? There are different kinds. Some of them have pictures in them. Some of them um, have different books in them. And they're all a little bit different, but they all tell us about the story of God's people, about God, and about Jesus. And a lot of the books, we call them books, because some of them are, a lot of what is written in the Bible is about history, there's a lot of stories, and there are also a lot of letters. Did you guys know that? Do you know what a letter is? Kids at heart, what's a letter? You don't know, right? Right? Because we, we don't write letters anymore, right? We don't. We write emails. We send text messages. But actually, Pat, who is in the choir, handed me a letter when she walked in today that was written by your cousin? Is that correct? My mom's cousin. Your mom's cousin. Okay. And it's in Norwegian, so I can't read it because that's not a language <laughs> I speak. But this is a letter, and she was writing a letter to her family and her friends to tell them about what she was doing. And in this letter, she included pictures, and she told them stories, and she told them about the people she was with and the kinds of stuff that they did. And a lot of what is written in the Bible are letters like this without the pictures because they didn't have cameras, okay? But they tell us what the people did. They tell us about the church at that time. They tell us what people were learning. They told us about the problems they were having. And most importantly, they encouraged the people to keep believing in Jesus 
and to keep telling people about Jesus. And so when we get to, especially the way our Bibles are set up, towards the end, there's a lot of smaller writings, and by smaller I mean shorter. They're, they're not very long, but those are letters, and they are letters written by people to churches, encouraging them to keep loving Jesus, to keep telling people about Jesus, and to keep sharing that message wherever they go. Does that make sense? Kids at heart, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah? Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for letters. Thank you for letters. Thank you for the people who loved you. Thank you for the people who loved you. And who helped others learn to love you. Because they helped us learn to love you. Because they helped us learn to love you. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Our first reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 17. After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I proclaim to you. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous. And with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. While they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, they attacked Jason's house. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city authorities shouting, these people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has entertained them as guests. They are all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this. And after they had taken bail from Jason and the others, they let them go. Word of God. second reading. That's okay, we'll do it again. It was good. We just warmed up on that one. Okay, you with me? Get ready. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers. Constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to, I'm sorry, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. And for in, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia, 
For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Word of God. Word of life. Let's do it again. no such thing as too much singing in church, right? <laughs> Grace to you and peace from our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are still learning about the early church in our readings during this Easter season. But today, we've jumped way ahead from where we've been. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus told the disciples that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria to the ends of the earth. For the last couple of weeks, we've been reading about their witness in Jerusalem. But today, we've skipped Judea and Samaria, and we're at the ends of the earth part, at least as it was known then. Peter is no longer in the story of Acts. From now until the end of that book, it's all about Paul and his witness. Up to this point, the story of the apostles' witness to Jesus has been about Jewish Jesus believers, meaning people who have a strong connection to the stories, teachings, and traditions of Israel. But as Paul moves outward from that center, he's encountering more and more Gentiles, which are non-Jewish people who don't have that connection and that history. The other shift that's happening here is the transition between the people who directly experienced the ministry of Jesus and the ones who didn't. It marks the growth of the church as the tradition and stories are passed from one generation of disciples to the next. And more specifically, it marks the transition between the ministries of Peter and Paul. So there are a few layers of things that are happening here. The setting for today's reading is Thessalonica. It's a major, Greek, or a major city uh, that's in modern day Greece. It was a center of trade. And at the time that Acts and First Thessalonians were written, it's part of the Roman Empire. And when Paul and Silas arrived there, they went to a synagogue, which at that time was most likely a small gathering of people and not a dedicated building, at least not one for worship. The community is what mattered. That was the most important thing, was the gathering of the people. And Paul and Silas gathered with this group of people for about three weeks to tell them about Jesus. The NRSV, the Bible translation that we use in our bulletin, doesn't quite get it right when it says that Paul argued with them, at least not the way we tend to define what it means to argue. In the conversations that he had, he made a claim of faith and used scripture to support it. And the people who were with him would have responded with, well, okay, but what about this? And they would have gone back and forth and had an honest debate and discussion about what Paul told them about the Messiah. It was a very common practice and common way to to have a dialogue. The riot in the street that happened later wasn't about those faith claims at all. The accusations that the ruffians made against them have everything to do with Paul and Silas being a threat to the social order. And they're not wrong. The good news of Jesus, the love, the grace, the mercy and compassion that he taught does turn the world upside down. It upsets the caste systems that the Romans and the Greeks had put in place. So that reaction to the gospel message is very definitely about politics and maintaining the social order. And the accusations that they bring against Paul and Silas echo the charges that were brought against Jesus on the night of his arrest. And that tension didn't just go away, but the gospel message was received. 
not by the people who caused the riot, but by others who turned away from the idols they'd been worshiping and toward the living God. It disrupted their lives in ways they couldn't have imagined, and people noticed. Word got around about how much their lives changed. So much so, they became an example, a model for others. And that isn't to say that it was easy for them. Jesus didn't leave an instruction manual to refer to, and the Gospels hadn't been written yet. But those believers took the testimony of Paul and Silas on faith and went on to form the early Christian community in Thessalonica. And the letter that Paul wrote to them, giving thanks for them and encouraging them, is for us too. We are among the many who don't have direct experience of the ministry of Jesus, but we are the recipients of the witness that has been shared with countless generations, the witness that the early believers bravely shared in a world that was unfamiliar to them, and the good news that we now bear witness to in our life together as a congregation. Like the apostles and the first Christians, we never know how the gospel will be received, but we're still called to proclaim it. And when we receive others' proclamation of it, because it goes both ways, we have a choice in how we respond to it. Because the good news of Jesus is disruptive. It changes our lives in ways that we can't foresee, but it is good news. It is what forms the basis of our congregation's works of faith and labors of love and steadfastness in hope. The things we gather around and examine and consider and discuss and that guide us as a community and that ultimately become the outward expression of our faith in the world. And it isn't always well received. Sometimes it's ignored. Sometimes it's ridiculed. Sometimes it's taken advantage of. And sometimes we're able to shake all that off and keep going, but sometimes it hurts. It's hurtful because it's so personal to us. But even in those times, it doesn't mean we stop our proclamation or our witness. Instead, we continue to come together and encourage one another and open our hearts to the disruptive good news of Jesus. Yesterday morning, 20 people representing five of the six ELCA churches in our cluster gathered around a table to talk about what the future might look like for our congregations. You've heard me talk about these conversations before. We've been having them for a couple of years, specifically about partnering and collaborating together in ministry. And we've already started doing that with things like the tiny home build last summer, Game nights, there's a game night here tonight, by the way, that is a shameless plug, starts at five o'clock, you are all invited. And we're also helping Mount Si Lutheran while Pastor Krista is on sabbatical. But in addition to those, we've also been thinking and talking bigger than that and asking the question, what would it look like to come together? Not as one congregation, but as one entity or one parish with many sites. It's a model of church that's radically different than what many of us are used to. And as we've explored the answers to that question, they center around more effective witness to the gospel in our respective communities, making the good news of Jesus, the love of Jesus, known in our communities. We formed subgroups to begin addressing the details, and more are in the process of being formed because there are so many moving parts in each congregation that's involved in this. And as we talked yesterday, there was laughter and positivity and excitement and wonder about what all of this can become. And there was also honesty and an acknowledgement that for some, this will possibly be a fearful time. The word scary was used. And as I thought about it in relation to our readings this morning, I thought, yeah, it's going to be disruptive especially in the sense that it will change us in ways that we can't foresee. Because when we consider the works of faith, the labors of love, and the steadfastness and hope that are present in each of our congregations, the way they guide our respective communities, 
we recognize the community that is formed in and comes out of the good news of Jesus. And that community and its witness is bigger than any one of our congregations. And coming together as one to do that is really exciting stuff. As people who follow Jesus, we take on the message of the risen Christ as individuals and especially as a congregation. We take on the call to bear witness to it in our world through our words and our actions. And when we talk about and embody the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus in a world where those qualities aren't the default setting, it's often met with cynicism and sometimes even hostility because it disrupts the status quo. The good news of Jesus is disruptive. There's no question about that. It changes lives in ways that can't be foreseen, even our own. And it forms the basis of our community's works of faith, our labors of love, and our steadfastness in hope. It guides us and our ministry, and it opens our hearts to the possibilities that that proclamation brings. Alleluia. Amen.
Trusting in God's baptismal promises, we affirm our faith using the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray to the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Living God, you gather all who are faithful to worship and praise you. Help your church throughout the world to listen for your spirit that your love and grace may be shared with everyone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Renew our commitment to use resources responsibly and to live well with your creation. Inspire us to recognize and nurture signs of new life in the natural world. Protect the people and places affected by severe weather in our nation this past week. Grant them a sense of security and the resources they need to rebuild. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for leaders in our community and throughout the world, that they may govern with your sense of justice and work for the well-being of all. Bring an end to violence everywhere and bring about lasting peace in areas of conflict, especially in Myanmar, Haiti, South Sudan, Israel and Palestine, and Russia and Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy. You are our source of comfort and peace. Protect the very young and the very old those living without housing, victims of domestic abuse, and all who live with chronic illness or compromised immune systems. We pray especially for Bill, Marlis, Andy, Marge, Tom, Julie, Lois, Jay, Belinda, Leslie, Philip, Craig, Amy, Greta, Jackie, Duane, Ralph, Linda, Alexandra, Beverly, Misty, all caregivers and all we lift up before you now. For whom and for what would you pray today? Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the resources that allow us to partner with other ministry organizations, especially with Kid Vantage. Continue to bless our work together that the people of our community may know your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You hold us securely in your loving hands. We give thanks for our loved ones who have died and who now rest in you. Strengthen us with the hope of resurrection until we are gathered together <clears throat> around your heavenly table. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord, Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Thank you. Please share God's peace with one another. Peace to all of you who are worshiping with us online.
to meet you again. We will receive communion today around the rail, either standing or kneeling as you're comfortable. Please follow the usher's instructions as you come forward. Uh, it was brought to my attention uh, yesterday that an email was allegedly sent from Pastor McEachern's personal account. If you receive that, it is spam. Do not click on the link that is in it. If you did click on the link, run the antivirus software on your computer and check for all of the usual bugs that come with things like that. Uh, but I talked to him yesterday and he said, no, we didn't send that. You know how he does that, right? All right. <laughs> no. All right. Um, as I mentioned in my sermon, game night here tonight starts at five o'clock. Don't worry if you did not sign up for it. Bring a snack to share. Bring a favorite game if you have one. We will be done and out of here by 7 p.m. So it's, it's a very... Um, very relaxed evening, good opportunity to get together for fellowship with folks from other congregations in our area and just have some fun. Uh, please check the bulletin, our weekly and monthly newsletters, and our social media for all of the upcoming events and activities. If you are bored, the chances are good we have something for you to be a part of. So please do take the opportunity to check that out. As we continue our worship with our musical offering from the choir, we also take this time to reflect and give thanks to God for the gifts in our lives.
Pray together, risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed and broke it and shared it with his friends, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Can I get three chimes? After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This meal is the gift of God for the people of God. All are invited and all are welcome to receive this gift of grace. Please be seated as I commune our people who are worshiping online. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
As you are able, please stand. Let us pray together. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend, amen. Before I bless the quilts, Elaine, welcome back. Yay! Elaine had tendon surgery on her left hand five weeks ago, and so she's slowly working her way back in. This is actually part of her physical therapy, so <laughs> it works. Uh, if you are near a quilt, I invite you to, and if you want to get near a quilt, that's fine too, you can go ahead and move. Uh, but we're going to bless these quilts. They will be sent out next week. They're going to Lutheran World Relief, along with some care kits that we will also put together and send. And these, um, there are churches literally all over the country blessing quilts today. So we are one of many that, that are doing this. And it's an honor to be able to do this. They were crafted by our St. Andrew's Dorcas Circle. The Dorcas Sewing Society is a worldwide organization that grew out of the story in Acts chapter 9, where Dorcas generally gives of herself to others by sewing clothes for the needy, and her name is synonymous with acts of charity. And so, as I said, the quilts we bless today will be shipped to Lutheran World Relief for distribution around the world. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the people who generously shared their resources in order to make these quilts possible, and for those whose hands have made them. Strengthen and encourage the staff and partners of Lutheran World Relief who will distribute these quilts around the world. And God, bless the people who will receive them, neighbors we have never met. May these quilts wrap them in love and fill them with the peace that is only found in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Amen.
to come forward to join me in the sending. Okay, we tried. Well, here's one. <laughs> <laughs> 